I sometimes encounter the situation and even sometimes spot a video on YouTube where the diameter of a laser beam needs to be known. One crude way of doing it might be to take a ruler to it, but it gives a very wrong figure depending on the type of surface the light hits, giving the impression that the beam is much larger than it really is. One of the most ineffective ways to measure the diameter of a laser beam is with a ruler. I look at this and I think it's probably about two millimeters in diameter. Let's find out what it really is. I'll describe a measurement where a razor blade is used to measure the diameter of a laser beam. Here I have a razor blade and its gray holder blocking the beam from reaching a photo detector. I'll graph the output of a photo cell as this razor blade is dragged across the beam. Flux is a radiometric term for power. It's literally the watts detected. And the bottom graph shows the position derivative of that power, d phi by dx. And the power continuously increases, but you know what that is, is the integral of the actual power throughout the beam. The power distribution in a beam is Gaussian, and so the top graph is the integral by x of a Gaussian. Gaussian is a full width at half maximum of W, which is related to the standard deviation of the Gaussian. When you're talking about something like the width of a laser beam, you might want to use full width at half maximum. Or as is commonly done, the e to the minus 2 width of the beam, which is the width of the beam when the amplitude has gone to 13.5% of its peak amplitude. And then a Gaussian, that happens at 4 sigma, 4 times the standard deviation. Now, as I was making this video, I suddenly had this objection to the technique. I thought this. I thought, well, if you look at the power distribution across the beam along a line, that will be Gaussian. But I thought, well, the light in this circular area is continuously increasing as you go through the spot. And doesn't that influence what you get and change what it is? Let me quickly rebut my argument and in the process go over a little bit more about Gaussian beam distributions. The irradiance given by E, E is not electric field, I'm using radiometric terminology here. The irradiance is described by a Gaussian where you have the exponential of x and y squared. Pulling the razor through the laser beam starts to flood the sensor with light, but wait a minute. Let's stop right here. How much power does the photocell see from the light contained in this little sliver? You find that by integrating the irradiance flux, which is the radiometric term for power, or watts, the integral of irradiance over the area, so integrate it over that yellow sliver. The x integral simplifies down to just the Gaussian in x times delta x because delta x is very small, so there's not much change in x, so you can just take away the integral. But in the y direction, there's a significant variation in the value of the Gaussian function, so you have to maintain the integral in y. And what do you integrate from? From y equals minus infinity to y equals plus infinity. And we know what that is. That's just a constant. Integral of a Gaussian over all space is just the standard deviation times the square root of 2 pi. You know, it doesn't matter what it equals. The point is, is that it equals a constant meaning that the power picked up by the detector is described by a Gaussian in X that has the standard deviation of that Gaussian. So dragging the razor blade across the laser beam provides the same full width at half maximum with it being a two-dimensional distribution as if it were a one-dimensional. We'll measure the diameter of our laser beam using a Heaney laser and a photodiode and a razor blade. The components in this experiment include the helium neon laser, the razor blade, which is mounted on a micrometer driver with a one millimeter of range, a diverging lens with a focal length of minus 30 centimeters, one neutral density filter, a photo cell, which is in series with a 1200 kilo ohm resistor and biased with a nine volt battery, and a multimeter to monitor the voltage across the photo cell. The diverging lens addresses a systematic error in this measurement. If you look up close in a photocell, you see a meandering line of photoconductive material. Light causes the material to become more conductive, and that's how it's sensitive to illumination. The meandering pattern is the key to this systematic error. Put the laser beam on it, but put the razor blade in the way. Draw out the razor blade, and you'll realize that certain sections of the meander line become exposed to light faster than other sections of the meander line, and that distorts the shape of the Gaussian. The result is a Gaussian peak that has little peaks in it. The systematic error is addressed by using a larger laser beam, 
accomplished simply by putting a diverging lens in the path so that a bigger spot hits the meander line. And now the effects of non-uniform illumination on various parts of the meander line are significantly reduced so that we can get a curve that more resembles the Gaussian distribution that's expected. There's no reason to believe that the photocell is linear in irradiance. So I need to check that out with a series of neutral density filters. When there are no neutral density filters in the path, but the room lights are on, I have 6.36 volts across the resistor. So insert a single neutral density filter in the path, and it drops to 5.15 volts. Insert a second neutral density filter, and it drops to 3.72 volts. Insert a third neutral density filter, and it drops to 2.82 volts. Insert a fourth neutral density filter, and it drops to 2.46 volts. If I allow no light to hit the photocell, I have 2.3 volts, that's the room lights. I can repeat the same exercise with the room lights turned off, and I'll see a similar result, except that it will be shifted down and it will hit zero volts when there is no light hitting the photocell. The photocell voltage as a function of the number of neutral density filters, which is the same thing as the photocell as a function of the brightness of the laser, increases linearly up to a point. When you get more than three neutral density filters in there, it becomes nonlinear. Now you may be surprised, why is the low illumination range, that is with a lot of neutral density filters, the nonlinear region shouldn't be nonlinear when it's getting hit with brighter light? Keep in mind, we're not measuring the nonlinearity of the device. We're measuring the nonlinearity of the circuit, the photocell with a 1200 ohm resistor and a 9 volt battery. As the photocell becomes more resistive, which it does with less light, it gobbles up more of that 9 volts, but 9 volts is the limit. As the 9 volts is approached, linearity is lost. This is the linearity of the circuit. So it's not necessary to attenuate the laser beam with a neutral density filter. However, I am going to use one to reduce the intensity enough that I'm comfortable there are no heating effects going on in the meander line of the photocell. So I'll turn everything on, the voltmeter, I'll bias the photocell, and I'll turn on the heating. Right now the laser beam is completely blocked by the razor blade, and so none of it is making it to the photodiode. I'll start with the micrometer all the way out at one millimeter, and I'll start to drive it in, and we'll see the illumination increase as the razor blade gets out of the way of the beam. And that's about as bright as it's going to get. I'll start with the micrometer set at 600 microns, and I'll start to drive it in, and I'll take a data point and irregular intervals, because when I get near the peak, I want to capture more data points. At 600 microns, I have 6.27 volts. At 575 microns, 6.22. At 550 microns, 6.18. Now let's take some smaller steps. At 490 microns, 5.95. 480, 5.89, 410, 5.33, 300, 4.11, 50, 3.83. I'll stop with that. Bring this into origin. I brought in the data I just took, the position of the micrometer and the voltage across the photocell, and take the derivative delta photocell voltage by delta x and make a column for a derivative, and let's plot that versus position. We're going to fit this to a Gaussian using the nonlinear curve fitting tool in origin. Peak functions, Gaussian, and we'll fit to it. And that's the Gaussian fit to the derivative of the photocell voltage with knife edge position. The full width at half max of the Gaussian is 213.8 microns with a fairly big uncertainty of 15 microns on that. Reduced chi-squared is meaningless on account of the fact that there are no uncertainties put into these derivatives.
when you turn in your laboratory measurements, you need to have uncertainties on these data points so that your reduced chi-squared can make sense and we know actually how good the fit is. And hopefully you won't do it as quick and dirty as I do it. I suggest taking larger steps in X so that your derivative doesn't look like this. It will be less noisy. You can use a neutral density filter to prevent heating at the highest illumination. And use a diverging lens to stay out of that trap of light not falling on the meander line in the photocell.